Hello and welcome. I'm at Shell's Powering Progress Together event at London's Olympic Park and we've been talking today about the future of transport, how people are going to live, work and travel, not just now, but up to the year 2040. Um, so Baroness Brown, let me start with you. Um, we've talked a lot today about um, what transport will look like in 2040. Can we just narrow down to one big change you think that we're going to see around the world in the way that we travel in 2040? Gosh, that's a very difficult question when you say around the world because we don't all travel the same way today. But uh, let me say it'll be cleaner and quieter. Is that the technology or the government policy that's doing that? Well, the technology will deliver cleaner and quieter, but we will need government policy, I'm sure, to drive that to make sure it is. I would say that the one, if you like, I hope that will be the, the biggest revolution is moving away from the one person, one car or one parcel, one van to a shared, efficient mobility system. If we can revolutionise that attitude, I think that would be one of the big things that we can take away. So how does that then all translate to um, policy? We've seen famously last year France put a ban on the sale of diesel and internal combustion engines. Uh, Britain followed shortly afterwards. Um, and um, that seems to be the sort of direction in which we're going. Does it feel like that is the right kind of policy proposal? Is it fast enough? Um, should it be sooner? Norway has said 2025. 2025. Scotland has said yeah. 2032. Uh, in the Committee on Climate Change, uh, in our reports, we've recommended that in the UK, we need to be at least 60% of vehicles by 2030 uh, need to be um, plug-in hybrid or, or full electric. So 2040 for eliminating uh, conventionally fueled light duty vehicles is actually quite slow. And if we're going to meet the Paris commitment, which goes beyond uh, the UK's current commitment of an 80% reduction by 2050, we really have got to start thinking about how, how do we eliminate emissions how do we get them to zero emissions really as, as quickly as possible? Because there are going to be you know, heavy lorries, um, heavy goods vehicles, which are going to be much more difficult. Aviation is going to be much more difficult to decarbonise. So the stuff we can do, actually we need to get to zero um, as quickly as we can. I think, it's, I think one point I would pick up on is government actually have not said they're going to ban anything. They've said they aim to end the sale of conventional vehicles. And, and actually, I think Scotland have said uh, they aim to end the need for conventional vehicles in 2032. And to me, that's the right thing to do. We, we actually ought to focus on the objectives, decarbonisation and clean air, and delivering those objectives with, with the best technology and at the, the fastest pace we can. Picking a technology that we ban is not the right way of doing that. It's what are the objectives? So I would absolutely welcome the, in, the, the advent of zero emission zones, for example, but banning a particular technology without necessarily knowing what we can deliver from that technology in 22 years time, I think is a dangerous way of playing it. And government, to their credit, I think they are technology neutral. Let me disagree with you there, <laughs> because we are going to have to get to net zero somewhere not too far beyond 2050. So we cannot still be in light duty vehicles, in cars and vans, we cannot in a, in a rich country like this, still be burning diesel in cars unless you've got some kind of bag on the back that's collecting the CO2. You know, there will be other applications like aviation where it's going to be much harder to eliminate fossil fuels. We need the, the energy density. Um, and so if we, can't, if we can't eliminate them from road transport, then boy, we're going to have to have an awful lot of negative emissions technologies to compensate for aviation and some of the other crucial areas where we can't get to zero. So I'm afraid I disagree with you on that. I think fossil fuels emitting CO2 out of a tailpipe in, in light duty vehicles is going to be, we have to, we have to get rid of. And I think not giving the industry a clear decision that says, no, you won't be able to sell those vehicles is, is kidding ourselves. And actually it's not forming a level playing field uh, for industry. I hope and I actually believe we will actually get to this position much earlier than 2040. Mm -hmm. I, th I think, you know, for cars, and I I'll absolutely agree, there is no reason in the time frame that we're talking about that we can't get to a fully electrified light car 
uh, uh, light vehicle uh, uh, network. But we shouldn't rule anything out. I think you're absolutely right about net zero is a big challenge. And fossil fuels, no doubt about that, we need to remove fossil fuels and decarbonise our fuels as quickly as we can. Every country has you know, a different set of energy challenges that it's playing with. So um, what do you think needs to be done so that it isn't just you know, a couple of European countries that have put this policy in place, but there's a kind of global movement? Is there anything else that the world needs to do? Or is it just basically look at the Paris Agreement and find the solution that will fit your local country? Well, I think, I, mean, I think we shouldn't think it's just a few countries in Europe. We should look at China, mm. who've got some really ambitious plans. You know, that's a country that isn't as rich on a per capita basis as we are, and yet they can see the need, and they are doing, uh, setting some, some very ambitious targets. So uh, if they're decarbonising, and as they move to decarbonising at a rate that will be in line with Paris, then you know, we have a, a very important manufacturing nation uh, getting onto the right path. So I, I think sometimes we do think it's just us in the West, in the developed countries, and that's not the case. But we do, we do need India, we do need the whole of Europe, that's, that's true. And I think it's very clear that what we can't do is allow all of the developing countries that are at different stages of this to go through the same development cycle that we did, because that's why we're in the situation we're at now. So we have an obligation to help people avoid the mistakes that we made, and, and, and there are some mistakes in there, or that build on the learnings that we've got over many years. And that's where, you know, there's some great work going on here in the UK. There's some, we've got to be sharing that. There's some great work going on around the world in different areas. That connection and collaboration so that we all move forward as fast as possible together, because and I think we, we probably both agree, we're going to need every tool in the box yeah. if we're going to deliver anything like the Paris Agreement. Fascinating insights there from my guests, um, Baroness Brown of Cambridge and uh, Andy Eastlake. Thank you very much for your time. Um, do head to the Inside Energy website for lots more stories about energy, technology and the people and ideas powering our lives. And thank you very much for watching. <laughs>